So, uh, good afternoon. So this is uh, the last lecture. Will be the last lecture on course of the course on predictive distributed predictive control and estimation. And um, in this uh, in this course in this last lecture, I would like to address some complements to go deeper in some uh, details, or in also providing examples application examples. Um, the first uh, topic that we are going to speak about will be uh, distributed uh, LQ control. So for some of you, LQ control is well known. Uh, for some of you, it's not known at all. Uh, and for the benefit of those who don't know LQ control, uh, I I'm going to say just some basics. And uh, perhaps more interesting to everybody is, uh, I will recall how we can apply the game approach to distributed control. So this is the first topic. Then uh, I will uh, address an example on uh, uh, robotic uh, soccer, football, uh, that uh, will illustrate how we can use MPC uh, for such a kind of application and in a game, game uh, setting. And finally, I will uh, say, provide some examples about um, uh, adaptive MPC. So uh, let's start by uh, the basic uh, adaptive, by the basic linear quadratic optimal control law defined for an infinite horizon. So we have a plant which is our uh, our uh, linear finite dimensional plan described by the, this uh, state model, x of k plus one equals the way of x of k plus b u of k. And I define a quadratic cost, but this cost is defined over uh, an infinite horizon. Uh, and uh, the fact that it is an infinite horizon is important because it's the only way that we have to ensure stability. Uh, I'm assuming here that uh, this weight ma weighting matrices Q and rho. Well, it, let's consider the case in which B is uh, the U is a scalar, so B is a column vector, and uh, the weight on U square is uh, just a scalar. So rho is positive, must be strictly positive, and Q. The matrix Q that weights the states, the different components of the states. Uh, I, I wrote here that Q should be positive definite, but uh, it, uh, what I'm going to say also works for semi definite positive, semi positive definite matrices. Now, what is the solution of this? Uh, what is the solution of this problem? The solution is a feedback from the state. Well, the minus is just a convention. I could have placed a plus, but usually you put a minus just when else that feedback is should be negative. And this uh, vector of gains F is a row vector given by this expression, you see, that depends on A, on B, on the row, but also on this matrix S. S is uh, a symmetric matrix, and it is the only positive definite solution of the discrete time algebraic Riccati equation given here. Okay, so in the bottom of the slide, you you see this uh, this equation known as the Riccati equation, and uh, if you solve it, if you solve it, you you get an S, then you compute F depending on the value of S, and your control law is very simple. It's just a state feedback. Okay. Now, some comments about this law. 
first of all, how, how can you prove it? Uh, there are two main approaches. One is based on Pontryagin's maximum principle in discrete time. And the other is based on dynamic programming that we study in control of cyber physical systems. Uh, we are not going to do, to do the proof here. Uh, but uh, uh, I would like to say this. Well, using this control law is very simple once you know A and B. Uh, actually, I mentioned before, you, you can uh, use the DLQR function in MATLAB that solves, that computes these uh, feedback gains for you. Uh, I would like to remark that this law is optimal in the sense that it optimizes the cost that I specified. Uh, but um, it may, the performance may be not so good because in some cases uh, it yields uh, too much overshoot. However, it's quite important because it is always stabilizing provided that the pair AB is controllable and A and some square root of Q, what is the square root of Q is some matrix or vector such that this, this uh, matrix transpose times itself is equal to Q, okay? Is observable. So if you can find some matrix or vector such that the transpose of it times itself uh, is Q, then if A square root of Q is observable and A B controllable, uh, then you, you can, you, you have, you are sure uh, that uh, the, the, the control law is stabilizing. Uh, actually, uh, I'm sure that you are going to, to look at the problems for self-study with a lot of attention because the exam will be made out of it, out of them. Problem in problem 20, you, it's a simple application of the Aponov's direct method uh, to show that uh, this candidate Lyapunov function, x transposed s x, where x s where s is the solution of the Riccati equation in the previous slide, that this is actually uh, uh, Lyapunov uh, function and it decreases along the trajectories of the solution of the closed loop system. Uh, so uh, we can think of the LQ controller is a machine of producing stabilizing controllers. And there are more powerful methods that require to be initialized a stabilizing controller. So you can start by computing LQ, the LQ controller and then recompute or adjust the gains or adjust the control law uh, from it using the algorithm. Now it depends on, on the method that you are using. Now, uh, let's do something that uh, paves the way to distribute it, uh, linear quadratic control, LQ control. So we can consider the situation in which our plant has some disturbances that you can measure, okay? So in addition, x of k plus one, in addition of being a of xk plus b, UK, it has an extra term, some gamma D that may depend on time D, okay? Uh, and uh, let's assume that uh, YK, you have an output equation as well, YK equal to CXK, okay? Now, we want to minimize the quadratic cost in which uh, we are penalizing deviations the square of the deviations of y, k with respect to some reference r. Um, uh, so this, and what is the solution? I'm not going to, to show the solution either. The technique, uh, uh, the techniques are, are uh, the same as in the basic problem. So you can use, for instance, Pontryagin's maximum principle. That's what I, I did to 
find these formulas. And uh, what is the solution? Look at it, this equation five. Uh, it has two parcels. Your optimal controller, you opt at each time k, is made of two parcels. One is the good old uh, uh, feedback from the state. The gain is exactly what, uh, what you, you have found before. Uh, so uh, k depends on, well, I'm calling it p here, and p verifies this equation. Actually, you can say, but this is quite different from the previous equation. Well, be careful, because here I'm involving the gain. If you replace this expression for the gain and you do some algebra, then you will get this other form of the recut equation. Actually, this is with more uh, property called the recut equation. So uh, one of the terms, when we have feed forward from accessible disturbances and eventually a reference, is nothing more than uh, the state used for the regulation problem. And then you have another term that I call the feed forward, UFF. U -feed. This FF is, stands for feed forward. And this term depends on the disturbance and also on the reference, okay? So, and the, the expressions are here, it's not important exactly what, of course, if you apply this, it is important and you can use it, the expressions are correct. But what is really important here is that you can compute it and this UFF depends on the reference and on the disturbance. Now, uh, in, in many cases, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, using feed forward from accessible disturbances uh, are, are important. Uh, let me tell you what uh, uh, an uh, old colleague of mine is still active, but uh, while well, he retired, but he's still active. Sometimes I see papers from him. He was a, a practical engineer. He was not professor at university. He had a research uh, center of his own that was living out of uh, contracts from the industry, mainly the oil industry. And he had a tremendous experience, in particular in model predictive control. And uh, once he told me, well, uh, of course, you apply, you apply control because you want to improve the performance and the performance means money. But uh, uh, sometimes you don't improve it too much. What, uh, one of the things that really gives a significant improvement in performance is to take advantage from accessible disturbances. Because accessible disturbances, at, uh, if, you, if you measure them, you can compensate them very quickly and uh, the performance increases very much. Remember that when you rely on feedback from the output, you need to have some error for the, for the, the controller to act. But with feed forward, if the, there is a change in the acceptable, uh, in the accessible disturbance, then uh, you can act immediately without having the need for your process variable to deviate from the desired point. Okay, so you anticipate things and you make the, your control actions faster. So the performance is very good, it's much better. The price is that uh, it is less robust with respect to uh, model errors. Uh, and uh, Jacques Richali, it was the name of his, his French. Um, Jacques Richali told me, well, uh, feed forward from accessible disturbance is, an, is a way of making money. Okay? It's one of the feedback, okay, but uh, feed forward is expected. Uh, you get much better results. Um, and he knew, knew what he was saying because he was living out of contracts from the industry. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, okay, then this is important in itself, but here I want to explore it 
as a way of uh, designing a distributed control system. So let's uh, consider again our plant. X is the state of the full plant. So I decompose it into systems. I assume that uh, I have four systems and uh, I have uh, a block diagonal dynamics. Okay? So each system does not interact with the others through uh, the state. But then I look at the B and the B is three diagonal. So uh, this means that uh, system two interacts with system number one, system one, two, and three interact, and so on. Okay. Uh, so each system interacts with the neighbors through the input. We have we have already discussed that, but it's uh, just think it's uh, useful perhaps to, to recall that. So if I look at just one of these systems, so this. Uh, Xi, just part of the total plan corresponding to that uh, part of the system. Then I have my, my uh, use, usual uh, linear model with A, AXI plus BUI. But then I have a term that I can see as a accessible disturbance because this delta is made of what? Perhaps some disturbance that you can measure. But also the controllers, the control values of the neighbors of system number i. That is to say, the control of system i minus one and the control of system i plus one. So I know this, these variables, the value of these variables at time k. Uh, I can use this value, of course, because I know it, but uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not able to change them directly, okay? So this can be seen as an accessible disturbance. And I can devise an algorithm in which, okay, I initialize my manipulative variable for it, uh, for each of the control agents, for of the local control agents. And then given, uh, I optimize the local cost, okay? Give a knowledge of the control var variables of the neighbors in the preceding iteration. Okay, this appears as feed forward variables. Okay, so I can use if my optimization is done with uh, LQ control, then I can uh, use the formulas for LQ control with feed forward from an accessible disturbance. And the accessible disturbance is nothing more than this factor. Okay, so I, I may not have GI, but I will have certainly the use of the neighbors, the control of the neighbors. Okay, and uh, then I recall compute my my local co cost and all the nodes of the system do that. So in the end, they have different values, and they tell, okay, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear neighbors, if you want. Now my variable is a different one. Okay, if it is a different one, now I can recompute things and I can do a, a cycle. I can do a cycle, okay? Uh, let me give you one example in which I have this sigma one and sigma two. They are double integrator plants. So uh, if you impose uh, a step at input of each of them, the output will grow as a parabola. And this is in discrete time, of course. But then there is an interaction uh, at input. So uh, the input of system number one affects system number two, and the input of system number two affects also system number one. Uh, so you have this, uh, this uh, interaction. And we have local controllers, okay, K1 and K2. Uh, K1 controls the state of sigma one, K2 controls the state of sigma two, but then they negotiate, they, they do some negotiation uh, uh, among themselves as I told. And uh, so before applying the control to the plants, there is a period of negotiation. This is not seen by the plants because this is an internal negotiation in which 
x1 converges to some value and x2 converges to some other value. Actually, uh, uh, you need some conditions for convergence, right? and we can state that. But let's assume they converge, and here you can see what what is the result? What is the result of this procedure? Okay, it evolves. Uh, so here, this index is not time, but it's um, the number of uh, negotiation rounds that you do. Okay, and what are the results? For instance, if you if you just do two rounds of negotiations, it becomes unstable. If uh, you do 10 rounds, uh, well, it stabilizes, but the performance is very good, very bad, you see. So the reference is in blue, the green, uh, the output. And uh, so it's, this is very bad. A lot of oscillations, a lot of deviations from the set point. Now, if the, you, do, you perform 100 rounds of negotiation, uh, then you have a very good performance, or at least a much better performance than the one with 10. Okay? And this is because uh, the gains are converging according to this uh, curve. Now, this is a, a difficult uh, problem. Usually, uh, you don't need so many runs of negotiation in simple cases. Okay? So the two double integrators uh, they are almost unstable plants, and uh, or they are actually unstable plants, uh, and because you have a multiple pole, and uh, over the unit uh, cycle circle, and uh, they are very difficult plants to to control in this way. Okay? But you could do it. In many other cases, you don't need so many. Uh, runs of uh, negotiation. So let's go back to the water delivery example that I mentioned in the previous uh, uh, lecture. Uh, here I have, uh, I, I, I had uh, shown solutions, the uh, solution of the problem, experimental results with uh, uh, MPC, with uh, accessible disturbances, and uh, the technique was quite similar. But now the advantage is that I have a closed form solution for the LQ problem with the feed forward. I, 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 I know how to compute the gains a priori. Okay, so it takes very little time. Uh, so I have, in this case, four controllers, four controllers that are uh, connected to each of the gates. So uh, controller number one measures the level immediately uh, upstream gate number one and adjusts the motor, gives orders to the motor that moves gate number one to open or close and so on for the others. And then there are negotiations. So these green uh, errors represent uh, negotiation uh, links. So C1 and C2 negotiate together. C2 negotiates with C1, but also with C3, C3 with C2 and C4, and C4 with just C3, okay? And there are also some uh, accessible disturbances from these side takes, okay? These side takes uh, are used to represent the, uh, the usage of water, uh, in agriculture. And uh, so you can measure the, the opening of these valves. And this works as a, or, the, or the flow. Actually, we measure, we measure the flow. And uh, we, we use this also as accessible disturbances. So that's the D variable. Okay? And um, let me show you some experiments in which uh, we open Q1, it was closed. We open between uh, times A and B, and uh, then we close it, and then we open Q2 between times C and D, okay? So let's see what happens. So you have here the four gates. Um, 
the, this first uh, this first uh, pot is the level the level of the water before gate number one, and the second pot is uh, the opening of the is the opening of the uh, is the opening of the gate. Okay, so in the uh, the the, the other pots are the same. So this is this third pot is uh, the level of water in gate in uh, upstream gate number two, and uh, this fourth pot is the position of gate number two, and so on, or gate number three, gate number four. And remember that at time A, so I start taking water from uh, the first. Uh, from the first uh, gate, and uh, then I close it. Okay, from time from A to B, uh, I'm extracting water from uh, pool number one, and you can see uh, actually at this point mark one that there is an immediate uh, response uh, from uh, uh, gate number from the the fact that. Uh, the from the fact that the accessible disturbance, that is to say, the side take uh, has changed, so immediately it closes the gate. You see why? Uh, because he knows that since I'm opening the gate, the level will go down, and he does not wait. This is not feed, feedback action. This is feed forward action. Since he knows, because this is uh, this variable is in the controller. Since he knows uh, that I'm going, the the level is going to uh, decrease. It immediately closes the gate to prevent water uh, to retain some water, some more water. Okay? So this is a feed forward uh, action locally. Now, perhaps more interesting than this is that since uh, gate number one negotiates with gate number two, uh, gate number two, the controller of gate number two is not affected by the side take of gate number one. But since they negotiate, uh, gate number two comes implicitly to know that there is uh, this change. So you see that there is also an instantaneous change, okay, that cannot be explained by Feedback, okay, and this also propagates with in a lesser degree to uh, gate number three because gate two negotiates not only with gate one but also with gate three, okay. So this example uh, uh, somehow tells you uh, or shows you uh, something about uh, uh, this negotiation process. Uh, this is another exper experiment in which you uh, want to uh, track a reference. The reference is in blue and the levels are, are uh, in green. Now you don't see the position of the gates. Okay, this is just the levels. Okay, it's written here. Gate one should be pool one, pool two, and so on. But it's the level, just the levels. Okay? Uh, the interesting thing here is that it grows goes for 18,000 seconds. 18,000 seconds is about uh, five hours, so more than four hours at least. And uh, we could go on and go on and it would work. It would not enter into instability. Okay, any question? So what I would like you to retain is this. First of all, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, if I, for a linear plant, I associate an infinite horizon, it must be an infinite horizon, not a finite one, quadratic cost. And if I solve this problem, the result is a stabilizing feedback of the state. Okay? That's quite important. Uh, the solution is a feedback of the state and it stabilizes the closed loop. Now, uh, you can generalize this problem for situations in which you have 
uh, accessible disturbances. And the, uh, to the feedback solution, there appears uh, an extra term that depends on T. If T has very signals, okay. This will depend on all the entries of T. Okay. And uh, this is the solution of the LQ with accessible disturbance. Now, I can take advantage of it for the situation in which I have local systems and I do an interpretation of the manipulated variables of the neighbors of each local system as an accessible disturbance. And uh, I then use this uh, coordination procedure that is actually a game. So, uh, I take this decision, so you take your decision based on what I know, I'm telling you. Uh, but you change your decision, no, myself, I'm going to change it, so you will have to change it and so on. That's this ping pong, uh, which is in this uh, uh, loop, okay? So these are basically the things that I want you to uh, recall. You want to make some questions? Okay, so let's speak about ro uh, robotic soccer. Uh, actually, uh, I did not mention it, but uh, the some uh, the work uh, on distributed control. I don't know. It's about four master theses. Okay, it's about four master theses of, of students of mine, and this robotic soccer. Uh, I'm going to show you some results and animations based or uh, made by uh, my former student Andre Menezes, who did an excellent job. So, uh, first of all, we need to model our players. Okay, if you want to model Christian, Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, some other player, it's it's a very difficult. Uh, difficult uh, job. Uh, our players are much simpler. So they are a, a platform with two wheels and a passive wheel. Okay? Now, if the wheels uh, turn at the same velocity, this platform will move ahead with some velocity V. Okay? Uh, so uh, if the wheels change at uh, uh, at, uh, with uh, a different, uh, uh, di different velocity, then this will turn. Okay? So we can have, we can have uh, uh, an angle theta with a velocity, with a turning velocity. Actually, this is a little bit misleading because this theta and omega should be centered at the robot. Okay? Uh, so we have the angular position and the angular velocity, and then the coordinates with some with respect to some initial uh, coordinate system uh, capital X and uh, capital Y. So don't get confused with uh, X being the state because the state can be anything else here. And um, we have this. Uh, Linear velocity v uh, and the coordinates x and y that depends on theta, of course on omega, but theta is the integral of omega, and uh, uh, they will depend also on this v and this uh, is the integral of v. Yes. Okay. Now, usually what you do is. Uh, um, you rely, you want to, to reach a reference. So you have some coordinates for the reference x half and y half. So the reference point is there. Again, don't, do not be mixed up with this R has nothing to do with the uh, weighting or with the matrix of weights in MPC, just the, the point where your reference is. And uh, you can define an error of which is the difference between uh, your center of your robot and the position R. So it's this vector here. 
okay? Or this distance, better to say. And alpha, which is the difference between uh, your orientation, theta, and the orientation you would like to have because you would like to, your robot to point in the direction of R. So your robot will point uh, to R when alpha is zero. Okay, so instead of working, instead of working with theta and the coordinates of, of the robot, I'm going to work with with alpha, the angular error, and the distance error e. Okay, so uh, I can uh, write the the equations for the unicycle. Um, usually, I I will write it in a continuous time. Uh, one possibility might be to use Euler's method, so approximate the derivatives by finite differences. Usually, this is not so good, but okay, let's do it. You can use more powerful methods, and then you you have uh, a state for uh, your robot, but actually what we are going to do is to consider equations that can be obtained from the previous ones from some algebra i'm not going to do it here uh, uh, some uh, the states are the errors okay the distance error and the angular error okay and xp is this vector so xp is made of e and alpha okay so uh, if you want to drive your system to the reference, uh, your cost function will be uh, quite simple. Well, here I'm assuming that Q is, uh, is just a scalar, but uh, I could give more importance to some, uh, to some of the components more importance to position or, or, to, or to angular error. So I want to my the norm, the square norm of, this is nothing more than the square of the Euclidean norm of this vector xp. So I want it to be small, as small as possible. But then I also use some regularization part and put some regularization part. Why? Because I, my robot cannot move arbitrarily fast. So I will penalize, I will penalize the manipulated variables, which is the command of the robot, for the velocities. Uh, but working with the errors, that's the point, uh, you uh, just have a regulation problem. So you want to uh, squeeze your state to zero and squeeze your controller also to zero. So there is a, a compromise. Now, if suppose that you have your your robot that you describe with the model, and then you have uh, a ball, and you want to intercept the ball, so um, uh, you, you need some time to intercept the ball. So you need to uh, do some uh, predictions of the positions of the ball. That's your target. That's your reference. The prediction of the of the the position of the ball okay prediction is not treated here you can uh, have a simple model for the ball and uh, uh, use this model to iterate it and to do predictions of the of the position of the ball okay uh, we can think of it in a naive way and of course there will be some errors but then uh, if i control the movement of my uh, of my robot uh, using MPC. MPC has some feedback. Okay, and this feed feedback will be able, up to some extent, to uh, uh, reduce the or uh, reduce the, the error. So the effects of it to compensate the error. Okay, so. Uh, let's think, let's uh, look at this uh, MPC problem. Uh, okay, so J, you know, it's uh, the previous uh, cost or something like that. Okay? 
So it penalizes uh, the square of errors with respect to the reference, that is to say, the position of the ball. And this position can be very uh, And then we have, okay, we have the dynamics. The first two lines of the constraints are the dynamics for the error and for the angular error, the linear error and the angular error. Then uh, you have uh, constraints on the maximum linear velocity of the vehicle, and also on the maximum angular velocity of the of the robot vehicle. Uh, then uh, you will have probably constraints. Uh, you will have some uh, dimension for the ball, so you cannot uh, be uh, inside the ball. Okay, so this uh, means that the square uh, of a circumference of the radius of a circumference at position Cx and Cy, that's positions of the target, of the ball in this case, must be bigger than the radius of the ball squared. Okay? And finally, you must be within the field. So your remember that X and Y are the coordinates uh, horizontal for X and vertical for Y, and uh, they must be within some bounds that uh, define the the field. Okay, so let's let me show you some simulations. That's the funniest part. Okay. So can you see the YouTube screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, interception of, of the, the ball. Now, first the ball is uh, fixed. Now the ball moves. Okay. And moves again in a, a different direction. Okay. So this illustrates the illustrates the, sorry, let me go back. Let me go back, okay. Now, suppose that uh, you have one striker and one defender. Okay. Um, now you, you have what is called uh, a difference gain because you have uh, difference means that uh, uh, both players are described by difference equations. You have a dynamic uh, optimization problem and you should, uh, you should uh, uh, solve your problem uh, now uh, with some interaction. In the water uh, delivery canal, the interaction was through the, the physics of the problem. Here, it's a different thing. You, you, you have an interaction through the formulation of the control problem, through the constraints, okay, in the control objectives. Uh, so you can write the, the, the equations for the striker, such as for the ball is uh, uh, the same in this case. For the defender, you have uh, two uh, extra constraints that uh, were built uh, or were included to uh, position the defender uh, to make uh, to make a barrier with respect to to the goal. Okay. Uh, now the the solution is not unique, and uh, you can probably find some other situations. And you can uh, extend these uh, results to uh, more than one striker and more than one defender. So let's see also some simulations. First, uh, uh, a simple situation. Just uh, just one striker and one defender, and the defender is trying to block the way. Okay, this is not pure. This is not pure MPC solutions. Okay, 
And uh, another city, another example, another example. Uh, okay, this is when they 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 have the uh, they change the ball among themselves. Two players of the same team. They have different colors, but uh, they are on the same team and they are changing the ball. Okay, this is a simple application actually of the first cost I mentioned because you can apply it each at a time. Uh, perhaps more interesting is this one. When you have four players. Okay. Let's see what happens. There is an element of stochasticity. Stochasticity here. Uh, if uh, everything is symmetric, uh, then uh, they would uh, come to a block. So we have to introduce um, differences in the quality of the players. And also, uh, uh, when, for instance, there is a dispute by the ball, when they both players want to get the ball then uh, we model that in a probabilistic way okay with some the strongest player will have the biggest probability to to uh, win to uh, pick up the ball okay so this was what i wanted to tell you about uh, robot soccer any question? What I would like to, to call your attention to in this example is that you can uh, use um, the MPC in a big, in a wide variety of uh, applications. And uh, then you will have to, and that's the role of the engineer, play with modifications of the cost and also include more or less constraints. Okay. Uh, in this case, uh, you also have a state machine that tells you in which phase are you. So for instance, if your team has the ball, you will play as a defender. If your team loses the ball, your team, you will play as a striker. Okay. Now, I won't take the break. Are you too tired? But uh, just more 15 minutes? I think it's better. Uh, so let's speak a little bit about adaptive control. Uh, there are many ways of uh, uh, obtaining adaptive control. It's very difficult to define what is an adaptive control system. For instance, uh, you can uh, show that uh, an interval controller is an adaptive controller according to some definition, which is not much useful. Uh, in a sense, an adaptive controller is something that changes its control rules depending on the situations or what happened to the process? Okay. So uh, one possible approach is this. Suppose that you have your process with some input U and some output Y. These are the variables that you know, that you have sensors attached to. And you have a controller, okay. So you have a classical feedback loop. Uh, oh, okay, you can include the feed forward variables if you want. Uh, but now, suppose that your process is changing, but changing slowly. So uh, an important uh, concept is that the change of the process must be at a slower rate than the fastest uh, state. Okay? There must be a separation in time scales of what we call states of the process and parameters that uh, change but much slower. 
So one possibility is that somehow you have some model of the process and you have uh, an estimator for of the parameters for the model. Okay? And the estimator can be recursively squares or can be other, other estimator. Uh, we don't we haven't speak of, we have spoken about this uh, model uh, this uh, about this block here of the parameter estimation uh, but okay let's assume that from data you can you solve a kind of inverse problem which from data allows you to infer what are the parameters of uh, your process of a model of your process okay then since you know the new parameters, you can recompute the gains, okay, and tell the, the controller to what are the new gains. So when the process changes, okay, the gains, the controller gains are re, re, redesigned, are recomputed, and affect the controller. And this can be applied to a wide variety of uh, control laws and also of estimation laws. For instance, we, we can have uh, adaptive uh, linear quadratic systems. So we have a linear quadratic controller. So you recompute, you estimate the matrices A and B from the process data. And you, you rec from A and B, you recompute the gains F, okay? So if the process has changed, then because of the wearing or for some reason, then your controller will try to match as best as possible the new dynamics of the process. Uh, uh, you might think, but uh, does it work? Well, it works in many cases. It, it, there are theorems that uh, it does not work always. Okay, you can give examples uh, in which it does not work and you, there, there is a lot of theory about stability of this uh, structure because you see, uh, this is a nonlinear system. Even if the process is linear and the controller is linear, what is happening is that you are having a nonlinear, a strongly nonlinear feedback loop associated to the story of the adaptation. And you are uh, changing. The parameters. The parameters are fast, are slow states. Okay, are slow states in a sense. So uh, you are inducing in the system uh, another uh, feedback that is nonlinear. So the system becomes nonlinear and uh, it can become unstable due to that. Uh, there are other approaches. This is a kind of explicit adaptive controller. Uh, we can have, uh, for instance, adaptation based on uh, the theory of uh, Lyapunov stability, okay? in which uh, you adjust the gains such that some function becomes a Lyapunov function. Okay? So you a priori have uh, you a priori have some warranties of stability. Now, this is somewhat elusive because first, uh, those techniques are much more complicated. And uh, second, <coughs> if, you have, um, if you have modeling errors, you might also have trouble. But uh, of course, the theory is much better. So let's consider this type of, of adaptive control loss. Uh, for us, the controller will be MPC, and uh, you uh, estimate the gains of some state model, for instance, and we compute the parameters of the MPC. Now, uh, in the case of linear quadratic MPC, you know that uh, you, you can compute uh, the gains by this, uh, you know, this table matrix and pi matrix that appear in multi predictive uh, models, and you can compute a vector of gains. Okay? This is the so called uh, GPC or generalized predictive control uh, of controller, 
a version that is somewhat simplified because uh, you can uh, complicate the or you can uh, change modify the basic formulation of the of the mpc problem for instance imposing that uh, u is not does not vary all over the full prediction horizon but only on part of it that's the notion of control horizon for instance you can change just the first move okay and in that case uh, uh, the equations become simpler but it's still a structure like this it's a feedback of the state this is the state now there is an in gpc there are thousands of papers and applications and uh, uh, you can easily find it in the literature. Uh, you, you can also think of this. Now, we are appro approximating, uh, we are approximating a linear quadratic problem, okay? Not over an infinite horizon, but over a finite horizon. But if the horizon is large enough, then we will end up with a constant feedback from the state. Okay. So someone, more or less at the same time of GPC, this happened in the, in the 80s, so 40 years ago. Um, someone said, okay, let's uh, assume that uh, if, you, if your current time is t, for uh, times t plus k, where k is 1, 2, up to the horizon, up to h, then we have... Uh, we have some uh, constant feedback of the state okay so uh, by using this from time t plus one up to t plus capital t minus one together with a state observer you can get rid of the future influence of u because you can refer everything to s and then use a, a state predictor or observer or Kalman filter to estimate this, actually it's a model of the plan, to estimate these future states. So uh, the only variable u is the one that we originally left free, which is ut, okay? So your models get incredibly uh, simpler because uh, your predictor of y at time t plus i given the state at t, will depend just on, on ut okay so that i is just one parameter a scalar and then you have some linear combinations of the state at time t s is the state at time t now you pay a price because it is practical also to predict the future values of u and the future values of u as as a, have a similar structure so it's again a scalar i call it u uh, that multiplies ut plus a vector that multiplies s. So the structure is the same. Now, instead of just predicting y, I am also predicting u. Okay? These coefficients, theta, psi, u, and phi, they depend on the feature gain. So you could iterate these things if you started with a model, but what we do is uh, we directly estimate from data theta i, psi i, mu i, and phi i, okay? So instead of, of uh, identifying a, a plant model, say a state plant model, and then assuming that uh, f is going to converge to an L2 gain and then compute this coefficient, this can be done but it's much better, not, much better not only because it's much simpler, but also because uh, the algorithm has better properties to estimate directly. So you do observations of y, u, uh, and the state, and you estimate these coefficients, okay? That's the Musmar algorithm, the Musmar algorithm multi-step multivariable adaptive regulator. Actually, this multivariable was uh, wishful thinking because I never saw 
an application of multivariable case. It's very difficult. Well, I saw, I had a student who did it when it was working that so well. Okay, so let me show you some examples of this uh, algorithm. Uh, this algorithm has a remarkable property, which uh, it's a bigger advantage with respect to GPC. It also has a drawback. I'm going to explain it in a moment. Uh, so uh, you can show that the, this algorithm is related to the cost. So uh, you are uh, adjusting, remember, of, of our uh, adaptation model. So you are adjusting the gains of the controller in such a way that they minimize the cost. Although they do not see the cost explicitly, but they are minimizing the cost and they minimize the cost uh, constrained to the model you assume. That is to say, suppose that your model is uh, five, fifth order, order five. And you assume that the model is order uh, two, okay? Uh, so it will adjust the gains to do the best you can with uh, uh, order two model, okay? And the, the trick is that you, we are not computing the, those predictive parameters, but we are estimating them directly from data. That's a, a big trick. And uh, of course, this assumption that future gains depend, that, that future controls are generated by a constant feedback. Uh, if this is not true, then your algorithm stops working. For instance, when you have frequent saturations, this type of algorithm does not work. Okay? Or at least you, you should uh, turn off the adaptation model. Uh, the adaptation mechanism. But let me show you a few examples, practical examples of difficult plants. Uh, one of the plants is this one. So uh, this is a part of a boiler that uh, produces steam and part of the steam is used or was used because this, this plant no longer exists. It was in Bahairu, it was dismantled some, a few years ago. And uh, part of it was sold to a, a factory, to two factories, Fizip and uh, Kimigal. And part of it was used to produce uh, electricity, to produce electricity. Okay, so uh, you are producing, you are producing your steam. And uh, the energy associated, uh, the energy associated to the steam, is uh, proportional uh, to the temperature of the steam. Okay, so you you think uh, uh, if I think of of the money I'm producing as a function of temperature, the higher the temperature, the the more money I'm. I'm I'm uh, earning because I'm producing more energy and I sell the energy. Now, uh, there is a limit to that. Okay? This, I'm assuming that I have a constant pressure. Okay, So pressure also influences the story. So suppose that pressure is well regulated. Now, uh, you cannot increase temperature uh, indefinitely because if temperature is too high, then you, you start causing micro cracks in your pipes, okay? The, 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 these micro cracks mean what? Means that the pipes will no uh, leave, will be useful uh, for less years. Otherwise you have to replace, after some time you have to replace them, okay? So there is a limit, there is a limit here. Uh, in this graph, the horizontal line is temperature, and the vertical line is a barrier associated to the fact that if your temperature goes to the right of this barrier, what happens is that you are degrading the physical structure, okay? Now, uh, I have here uh, two uh, probability density functions of the temperature 
associated to a bad controller, that's A, into a good controller, B. Uh, if you, you have a bad controller, then the fluctuations of the temperature is uh, bigger. And uh, you have to select your set point that corresponds. Assume that this is Gaussian. Okay. I mean, not necessarily be Gaussian, but this think it is Gaussian. So you have to select your set point low enough such that uh, the highest temperatures that you can achieve that appear with a small probability, but that's it, uh, they are below the barrier. Now, uh, since you have with equality, equal prob probability uh, values below or above, okay, what counts for the money that you are earning is a set point. Now, suppose that uh, uh, you in, in improve your controller. And when you improve your controller, your fluctuations of the temperature is much smaller. So the probability density function is squeezed. Okay. And so you can approximate the mean, that is to say the set point, to the barrier because you are going to uh, stay within bounds with the same probability, okay? So uh, this shows that there is a link in quality of control and uh, the money that economic performance, basically, the money that you are make, producing with the system, okay? So let me show you some uh, experimental results uh, on, uh, you have two graphics here above. Uh, actually, the, this straight line is the temperature, the set point, and the line that is varying is the, the temperature. And up to point A, uh, the standard controller that existed in the plant it was a, uh, based on a cascade or PI of PI controllers with some feed forward actions. Actually, these things are. It was very much optimized, okay, uh, is used. So uh, up to A, this large fluctuations, we are using the standard controller. And then we turn the uh, Busmar adaptive controller. And you can see that there is some transient, no worse than the others. And then you start having much less fluctuations here. And then you turn it off. And uh, again, the standard controller uh, exists. So, uh, in the in the adaptive controller, you could reduce much the fluctuations. So you could uh, increase the set point and earn money by two or three degrees and earn money. That is to say, if you look uh, here at the, if you look here at the, this is a valve position. So how, how do you control the steam temperature? The steam temperature uh, is controlled by injecting water. And what you see in, the, in this picture is the valve that lets you in, in, inject water in the steam. So when you inject water, the water uh, vaporizes and absorbs energy, so the temperature is decreased. Okay? Um, and, um, you can see, well, the, what is the, the scale, the vertical scale is uh, percent of opening, okay? So 10 means the valve 10% open, uh, 20 is 20% 20 opening and so, open and so on. And uh, what you see, when you, you turn on your adaptive controller, the adaptive controller, uh, you have much faster variations than in initial and final periods, okay? Because the, the actuator is trying to do its best. Uh, the opinion of the, of the technical personnel was that this was perfectly okay. No. So we, we were within bounds of, uh, within specifications, not only of amplitude, but also on the rate of variation of the valves. Now, another interesting thing is that up to this point B here, somewhere in temperature, you can see uh, two things. Uh, before B, uh, 
you were a little bit above the set point and the fluctuations are a little bit higher than afterwards, okay? Uh, and also here, what happens? Uh, you have less variations of the valve than afterwards. Uh, what happens was that up to B, we were using some value of the weight of the control variable, so the raw parameter. Uh, and then we decrease it. When you we decrease the uh, when we, we, we decrease the weight, uh, what happens? We were using what we call a positional grid, that is to say, no interval effect. And uh, you reduce the there is a small tracking error that is reduced. And uh, also uh, you reduce the fluctuations of uh, the output, but you increase the fluctuations of the manipulated variable. So there is a trade-off when you you decrease raw, you leave, you, uh, that is to say, you are penalizing less uh, the control action, so it is more free to, to change. And uh, you get better results in the output, but you have you increase the wearing of the okay. Any question? Still, uh, still two examples. I'm about to finish. One is a solar thermal plant. This is an, an experiment, uh, experimental thermal plant. The field, this field has half half megawatt of uh, power. Um, now you you. In Arabia, there are uh, fields uh, with 400 megawatts, so 800 these fields. Okay, uh, the the dimensions should not exactly be uh, 800 because they are using uh, better equipment. So, what is the idea here? So, you have a storage tank with some fluid. In this case, it was a synthetic oil that could go up to uh, 300 uh, degrees centigrade without vaporizing. Uh, now, usually they use uh, a salt that melts and you can go up to more than 500 degrees, 575 or even more. Uh, and then you pump, you pump your flow through these collector fields that you see here. So this, uh, these mirrors concentrate the uh, light from the sun in the uh, in a, a pipe where the uh, fluid is passing. So you heat the fluid, okay? And uh, you can, of course, the temperature is changing all over the is changing all over the the along the the pipes. Uh, but uh, you can consider two temperatures. One is at the returning point. So the, there is a pipe that comes from the storage tank, then distributes distributes through the different loops of collectors. Okay, and then there is another pipe that collects the output of the collectors and uh, drives the the liquid, the fluid. Uh, to the top of the storage tank. So you can consider the temperature or the average of temperatures at these points in this collecting pipe and also the temperature at the storage tank, at the entry, entry of the storage tank. Okay? So uh, here what we do is uh, we have uh, what is called cascade control. Okay? So you only have one actuator here, which is the flow. So you have a, uh, a valve with a PID that measures the flow and the valve. So you can impose the, 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 the flow of the fluid, okay? So that's your only actuator. But in cascade control, what do you do? Uh, suppose that you want to control the temperature here at the entry of the storage tank. 
So what you do is you take as pseudo manipulated variable the temperature uh, at this point of at the entry points from the uh, from the collectors. Okay. Suppose that if you have many collectors, uh, take take it as the average of these temperatures. So this is a kind of manipulated variable that controls that one. Okay. So this temperature will act at this temperature, but you cannot change this temperature. So you have another loop, which is an internal loop. The reference is the reference from this temperature here, these points, and uh, the actuator variable is the flow. Okay, so we, you have two nested uh, feedback loops. This is very common uh, in uh, industrial applications for in many cases, not only in the industry, for instance, in uh, uh, when you have the control of, uh, of a rocket, uh, you have an inner loop that controls the attitude of the rocket, and an outer loop that controls, say, the position or the longitude error or the azimuthal error of the rocket. And uh, the manipulated variable is the set point to the attitude control loop. Okay? So you have these two nested uh, loops. Okay, in this case, what we have, uh, so this, uh, this uh, uh, straight line is a sequence of set points for the temperature at the top of the tank. And the sick line is the, is the temperature. You can see that it is tracking it uh, very well. With some delay, you can see that there is a strong delay in action, okay? Because associated with the flow in the pipes. And then this thinner line okay, is the it's the uh, uh, temperature or the average average of the temperature at the output of the collecting of the collectors of the collector loops. Okay, and uh, this uh, line here. Okay, that with step with steps is this continuous line is the set point for that one. Okay, so the loop to control the thinner line is generating this uh, line made up of steps that acts as a set point to this inner temperature. Okay, and the manipulated variable for this. Uh, uh, thinner temperature is the position of, of the hole. Okay? So we have two adaptive controllers here controlling both loops with different time scales. Uh, usually, when you have several things adapting, it's a problem, it can be a problem because the adaptations can be, adaptation process can interfere. Things can uh, eventually become unstable. But here, everything works. Uh, were, was working perfect, perfectly. The last example, and with this I close, just two more slides, uh, is control of uh, arc welding. So uh, I have a car, a car, and you can see the car here marked with D, okay? You can see here a wheel, it's not so obvious, but this is a car that moves. And when it moves, when it moves, what happens? Uh, there is a cable, and this cable is being consumed. There is an arc. You can see the torch here at C on the picture. And uh, this electric is being uh, vaporized. So the metal is, being, is liberating particles and forming the seam, the cordon soldadura. Está a formar o cordon soldadura. Okay. And uh, there is a, an electric uh, arc uh, that increases the temperature. So this is uh, this is in a melting state. Okay. And this moves. So when it moves to the right, the, the car to the right, okay, the car is moving. Everything is moving. And you can see here in B, 
the picture of the, the part that, that we want to solder. Uh, you 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 start spreading this melting point. Okay. Now, what happens if I measure the temperature here? That is just the uh, physical constant. It's the temperature of melting of the material I'm using. So what uh, we do is to measure uh, the temperature uh, some distance apart from the point where it is being melted. Uh, and you do it with a pyrometer. That's A here on the picture, marked A. And uh, so we are measuring the difference of temperatures at the point where the pyrometer is looking to with respect to the top of the seam where uh, the temperature is at, at a reference. At a, at a constant given by the metal tem uh, melting temperature. So uh, this difference is proportional to the rate of cooling of the, the seam. Esta distância é proporcional à taxa de arrefecimento do cordão de soldadura. So the, this rate of cooling is quite important because uh, if you cool uh, too fast or too slow, uh, then uh, your seam will not be adequate. Okay? This is a very difficult uh, process. For instance, if you want to control this temperature or this rate of, of uh, cooling uh, with, say, a PID controller, uh, you, will, you will not be able to do it. Okay? Uh, again, I have uh, two students who were working on this process project. And uh, they, they did many trials with the PID, and uh, I don't know, maybe in 20, they got it, got an acceptable SIM once. Okay. Now, with the native control, you, you can get it. What you see here, you see the set point of the temperature at uh, 1200 degrees Celsius, and the, the temperature, okay? and the temperature measured by the pyrometer. And uh, this is the tension. So the tension in volts is uh, the tension applied to the electrode. It's a manipulated variable. Uh, and below you, you find the gains. And what happens? What happens was that after uh, say 55 or close to that, uh, the the plate, this plate B being soldered, uh, was uh, become with a different, uh, with a, the double of the thickness. The espessura da placa a soldar uh, multiplicava por dois, duplicava. So uh, you had uh, to adjust, and you can see here the gains. They, the, there is an initial transient, and they converge, but then the valve change the play changes, the dynamics changes, and the gains change again. Okay? This is a very complicated uh, process because you have a lot of noise. Also, you have traveling waves. And this is, we have simulations that show that it's quite interesting, uh, that reflect in the boundaries of the plate. So uh, the dynamics of this system is uh, quite complicated. And there is a wide vari variety uh, when you change the plate from plate to plate, uh, the story is, is a different one. And with adaptive control, you could adapt the gains in an automatic way. And also you could adapt the, the gains to a situation in which uh, the geometry of the, of the plate being soldered was changing. So this illustrates the, the story of adaptation. So, uh, with this, I close. Thank you very much for your for your attention here, uh, and that's it. This also closes the the course. The course.